guys, uh, you're joining us for another episode in the Beyond Sport podcast series. I'm joined, I'm Nathan, and I'm joined by fellow college teachers Craig and Mark, Year 13 student Aaron, and I'm pleased to introduce our guest today, um, former professional footballer, current semi-pro, and currently working in education. Um, known him a long time, and that's Alex Peterson. How are you, lads? You all right? Hi, hey, mate. Um, so. Really, to start with, Alex, we're wanting to sort of go back to the very start. So why don't you talk us through, like, from joining the academy at age 11 or 12, right through to, to where we're at now? Um, well, I was playing some the league for, for Armthorpe, and um, around that time, I was dipping in and out at Leeds and things like that. And then um, Paul Wilson came over and set the academy up, because I don't think don't I sort of structured the academy at the time. Um, and he came over and set that up uh, when I was under nines and he got pretty much the best the best players in Doncaster um, on trial there were big trials and asked and he asked me to sign them and I yeah I said no um originally um and I should have known football went for me then because I left it till the last minute he gave us about six weeks to decide um, and woke up one morning and I had to decide and I just said I didn't fancy it I wanted to carry on playing with my friends uh, so I played another year to the league and uh, then signed when I was under uh, under 11s um, so uh, went from there right through to 16. Um, I think Dom, is Don the kind of still working with you? Uh, yeah, he's still with the under 16s, I believe. Yeah, he was, now, he, maybe. he was my coach for a long time, did a lot of work with him um, through 16s and then um, got my YT two years there. Uh, um, successful youth team. I think we, there were so many players from that team that got professional deals. Obviously, getting a professional deal is different to making a career in football, but in regards to getting professional deals, I think that was a successful, successful team. We won, we came second in the league two years running, I think. We won the League Cup, the FA Youth uh, League Cup. Um, and then we're lucky enough um, to get my to get my pro and do two years, two years professional. Fantastic. That's class, Alex. We, we often remind our students of the importance of being committed and being focused on their studies. You know, would you say that's two key skills and aspects to be a you know a successful you know football career? I think I think it's a it's a it's important for life in general to be to have that attitude towards anything. So whether it be education, sports, whatever it might be, being committed and having that right mindset, that's ninety percent of the battle. Um, I mean, I'll openly admit I'm not the most gifted footballer. Um, when I was little, uh, younger, I worked as tall, I was quick, nippy skillful all these different things and then I shut up and um, just started bec- like a number nine hold up player but 90% of that is hard work w- working through that um, centre of excellence was was that determination knowing that you want to you want to progress but at the same time of course you've got school going off and you've got to be on the ball with that you can't drop off your GCSE you've got to carry on with them and I think that's where a lot of people fall off because they think they, once they've got that YT, they're gonna. That's them sort of. They don't have to focus on the GCSEs anymore. They don't have to focus on the education side of it. Um, whereas I think that mindset to what to complete whatever you are doing to the best of your ability and put that hundred percent in whatever it may be is a massive part to success in whatever whatever area you're trying to succeed in. Yeah, that's great advice. So you kind of mentioned there, Alex, about obviously the, getting the YT and then and then getting the pro. Uh, contracts and stuff kind of um what was it kind of like at that time in terms of like did you feel like the pressure was even on you even more than when you kind of can sign professional um yes and no i mean we, we when i signed when i signed pro at the time the the first starting 16 17 it was dwindling they didn't have many um players coming in and they had a few going out and um it was well known for the lads at the time that if there ever a chance to progress and make a name for yourself in that in that first team, because the difference between being in the squad and being a professional is totally different. You can be a professional at a football club and you can train on your own or with two people on the side and turn up and go home and have nothing to do with the first team. Um, so we knew for us players that signed the pro that there were a chance there and that if, if we worked hard enough and, and, and the manager at the time, Paul Dickhoff, said... If you're good enough and you work hard enough, you'll get your chance. Um, and that's where the pressure comes from because I think previously, I don't think there'd been that 
opportunity for players to progress as much. Um, but the pressure, I, I think, was from myself, um, thinking I've worked so hard to get this far. You've got to put the pressure on yourself to try and make it moving forward. Um, so the pressure was coming from myself. Externally, I, didn't, I don't imagine, I can't remember though much, though much pressure, um, apart from what you put on yourself, really. And kind of when you got that, was that was that all you kind of dreamed of? Obviously, being a being a you know through the academy, through the centre of excellence, sorry, and then YT was um, pro football always what you kind of thought that's what I'm going to do. I don't. If I'm being honest, I don't think it was. Um, yeah. I love I love football. I mm. watch it all the time. I love it. I love playing it. But um, probably to my own detriment, sometimes I'm quite realistic and take things as they are. Pretty much realised the chances of being a footballer as a young kid, you know, depending on how good you are, of course, are slim. So I never really took that into into account that that could actually happen. So when I was playing football, I was doing it because I enjoyed it. And I had this conversation. I've had it with my mum and dad before. My mum, when I got my um, YT and my pro, my mum was like, "I just thought it well, you were good, like, and I never really thought you were going to take it to that next level. I never thought it'd become a thing where you're professional." Um, but one, like I say, once you get to that 15, 16 and that YT is around the corner, that's when my mindset kind of changed a little bit and I thought, I'm here now you've got, to, you've got to make the most of it you've got to be doing the right things you've got to give yourself every chance be seen to be doing the right things, do the right things and um, that then changed and all I wanted, everything all the energy and my time was focused on being a YT and once I got that YT it then changed to being a professional Excellent. Excellent. Aaron, do you want to? Yeah. Although it were a great time uh, for you and your family when you got your, signed your first contract, how did it uh, mentally, how did you mentally uh, deal with it on, within the uncertain times of knowing in the run-up? Um, if, if I'm being honest, I can't remember being that nervous about it. I think I had that mindset at the time, and I, as I was, my dad would have said the same, that you go there knowing you've given everything. You know, you, you go and you, you've tried everything, every session's 100%. You've done everything away from football. You've not gone out with your mates. You've not drank. You've not done this. You've not done that. You've given it a lot. And if it happens that the, you don't get the deal you wanted or you're not happy with what's, what's offered or whatever it may be, you know that you've gave 100%. That was the mindset I went with it. So my mentality with that and my mental health in regards to that, um, never really wavered too much. Um, I kind of thought, I've given it everything. What I, is what he's said to me, he's said to me, and I'll have to accept that because if I've given everything, there's nothing else I can do. Um, so I wasn't too, um, I didn't get too high, I didn't get too low about that. Um, but ultimately, when I became professional and I got told, and there were, um, I got told I wasn't getting another deal after my second year, and certain things in those two years of professional, the mental health side of it, it wavered massively. It was totally different. A lot of our, uh, a lot of our students, Alex, for second year, within the next couple of years, even in a few months, they're going to be finding themselves in very like mature environments, whether that's at university um, or within employment. When you signed your, when you signed your deal and you sort of got thrown into the first team and you was with. Um, you was in that mature environment. How did it help you to develop not only as a, a footballer? Um, but as a person? Um, obviously, it improves you as a footballer because you're among better players, you're training every day, your standards are higher, um, the, you, you're getting better coaching than you were before, you're, getting, you're playing with all these good players. So your football side of it, you take care of yourself, you do naturally become better because you're doing it every day. Um, in terms of me as a person, it's the opportunities that being a professional footballer provides you with that develops you so much. So, um, for example, going out and visiting schools and talking to individuals, um, speaking, doing speeches, meeting different people from different backgrounds, um, going out on loan. I mean, I went out alone to Barnet, out, out of nowhere, really. Um, and that was like, a, that was crazy for me because I'm like Nathan will say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a homeboy. I, I lived at home until I was 21. Um, Never left Doncaster. I don't think on my doorstep. Loved it. No intention of leaving. And then get a phone call. 
um, Gaffer rang me and said, oh, you're going on to Barnet tomorrow. You're moving to London tomorrow. Um, and you're playing tomorrow against Cheltenham. And you don't have a choice in it. You just got to say, yeah. Um, so then you say with children about going to university, uh, sorry, uh, your kids going to university, it's similarly, you're, up, you're moving, you're going somewhere different. And I remember just thinking, wow, I've, I've got a play in a team I don't know tomorrow. And then I've got to move the next day to London. Don't know the area, not particularly keen on going. Um, and that were a big, but that were a big thing, but it made me grow as a person massively. Beca began to think for myself, I mean, don't get me wrong, my mum and dad were brilliant, they helped me with everything, but while I was there, I was thinking for myself, living on my own, doing things for myself. Um, and you've got, to, you've got to embrace those challenges that it presents you. I mean, like you say, again, with, with people going to university or new jobs, no one finds that comfortable. If you, are, if you, if you find somebody that finds that comfortable meeting new people, being in a new environment, that's a, that's a special kind of individual, that. So, um, yeah, it's just important to embrace those, those challenges that it presents. And they definitely um, developed me as a person. Um, no doubt about that. That's that's it. Was that for, before Edgar Dablet or after? Was he there? Uh, he was. He just left because um, what happened was somebody the the England B team manager had taken over, and I think he'd asked Gaffer for me to go over because I've been I'd been playing at the time in my first year pro, and I've been in and out first team, and I made a few appearances, but I weren't physically there yet. I was tall, but I was like a rake, and I didn't know how to use my body. Um, so I imagine playing against some of the centre halves, I was just getting knocked about. So. Um, sent me to Barnet and then um, he, David had just gone and then Bar I think he's called Bar Barraclough signed me and then two days after I got there Martin Allen got the job and he came in and he, he basically said to me I don't know who you are I've got no clue where you're from yeah. and he sat me down and he went you're not in my plans so I rang um, I rang your club and you can you can go back and that were it and that just that were it cancelled Crazy, it's it? sort of like it's kind of like good you got that ground on your own two feet because sort of that information that comes out of nowhere and sort of changing your environment changes your environment again can can knock a lot of people for six. So would you say like the fact you you learned to develop before that change happened kind of thing really helps um, helps to embrace it. Yeah, again, I think it's just about staying level headed. Um, I can understand why certain people in sport. You get carried away because they think whatever's in front of them is there forever. So, like, you, you take things for granted and, and you think this isn't going to change or this isn't going to do this. I was always aware that at Barnet, as soon as I got there, you could tell that things were up in the air. Then Mark, then Mark Allen came in, never really showed any interest in me. So, I kind of um, predicted it, saw it coming a little bit. I ran not because it was a good chance for me to play and, and develop and get a few games in the conference but I kind of saw it coming and again because I'm quite wary about what going, what's going off around me and I'm quite realistic with, with my thoughts towards things and practical in what's going to happen I kind of saw it coming and to be fair as much as I was good on the football side of it I was happy to get back to Doncaster anyway because London worked for me so Alex, I, I I remember you kind of breaking through onto onto the first team, and you you picked up a, an unfortunate injury kind of around the time where it was kind of coming to the end of your contract. How did that kind of impact you in terms of thinking right, what's the next stage, both kind of professionally, but also kind of on the mental side of it as well? How did that kind of affect? Um, if I'm being honest, massively. I mean, if you take it back to my first year pro, I was. For the first two months, I was nowhere near the first team. Um, not, not even near. I was training with James Harper and uh, Andy Griffin and a few other and, and the other young lads, Josh Mead. We were all training on our own. And then one day, Gaffer pulled me and says, "Look, keep going. We've noticed you. Blah blah blah. You'll get your chance." So for that first year after I got that chance, I've been in and around the the first team for after, for the rest of the season. I was travelling every away game. I made a few appearances. I was on the bench a lot. And I'm just thinking, this this is amazing. I'm doing well. I'm training well. This is brilliant. Get offered a new deal. Fantastic. It's all good news. Um, the manager pulls me in his office. I think Brownie was struggling with an injury. 
those short on strikers. It says, you're going to start my season as my striker. Um, do well. I had a decent pre-season. Um, and then he sent me on out along to Scarborough because we've got, we've got a load of striker and I weren't flying at the time. He sent me on to Scarborough and I played about, I think, 11 games in six weeks, seven weeks. And my body weren't used to it. And I went into a big tackle and I just got this injury. A little bit of a freak injury, really. And it basically stopped me. I couldn't walk, really. I couldn't run uh, in my hip. I had all sorts of problems. And that kept me out for about eight months. And originally, I didn't think it would be eight months. Um, I got told a couple of weeks most. So what had happened was I'd had all this good news, good news. Really, everything's flying. I'm going well. Playing well at Scarborough, good reports. And then um, I get told, oh, yeah, you're out for eight months and eight, nine months. And to be fair, other than waiting... There's not a lot we can do about it. So at first, you try and get that, you try and get wrap your head around it. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I can, I'm all right. I'll crack on with this. I'll, I can, I'll get back earlier. And then um, all of a sudden, it, I got some other news that it might be a bit longer. We couldn't really do much more. And that's when I started to struggle a little bit. And up until this point, mental health had not even crossed my mind because at the time, everything was going so well. Yeah. Um, and I remember, and I'll not forget it because I've spoke to lads about it before. And me and Nathan, are, there's about a group of seven or eight of us, close mates, been through school, and they, they know all about it. And I've spoke to them and they, they helped me through it. But I remember just sitting there and um, I watched some TV in my bedroom and I started getting chest pains. I didn't really think anything of it, of it. I kind of left it and got chest pains again, got a bit worse. And tried to stand up and walk it off. And as I stood up, I just went dizzy. And I couldn't stand up anymore, so I ate deck. Um, went downstairs, told my dad. I went to hospital, and it turns out I had a, like an anxiety attack. But it played about in my chest. So I wasn't even aware that I was struggling. I'd kind of, in my head, I'd accepted it. Um, but me like mentally, I'd not. It, like I had actually not accepted it and there were so many things that I'd just pushed aside really um, so from that point I had a couple, I had a week off club gave me a week off um, but from that point it, well, it was a struggle because I've gone from like I say good news all across the board football wise but now I've got no I've got, I'm out for 8 months I've got no contract next year I'm only on a one year deal um, and I'm not I'm not I'm noticing what's going off around me. So I'm noticing they're bringing strikers in. Jack Mackay's coming through from YT. He's a great player. He's scoring goals for fun. There's a lot of talk about him. So I know Doncaster's not made of money, so they're only going to keep one striker. They're not going to have two young strikers. I'm only 21, 20 at a time. They're not going to keep two young strikers, so I'm well aware of what's happening around me. And I'm thinking, I'm going to get released here. I'm going to have no fitness. I'm going to be injured. I've only got a few qualifications in coaching. What am I going to do next? And that's when you start worrying, you start thinking. Um, but then I started speaking to Corpse, James Coppinger, and you know, he, he does a lot with mental health and different things. And he was brilliant, and he just he, he helped me through a few things. Obviously, my friends, my family, things like that, they're rolling it. And eventually, I wrapped it around and accepted the fact that I'm going to be out. I'll probably get a month left at end of season um, of fitness, and I'll just have to accept what that is go on trial at a few clubs and see how we get on um, moving forward. And once I'd accepted it and had time to think about it and wrap my head around it, that I weren't going to be at Doncaster New Year and something new was going to happen, then it helped. But there were, there were two or three months where I, I, did, I did struggle, really struggled. Yeah, yeah. You, you've mentioned about you know, being released and uh, I've read about a lot of players. Once they get released, that's it. They drop out of football. They're not interested anymore. Um, but you, you clearly, you know, stayed within the game and that's, you know, absolute you know, class that you've done that. How did you overcome that once you were released? Um, well, that was another thing again. I, once I was released, I, I, spoke, I had an agent at the time who did nothing for me. Um, he didn't get me a trial anywhere, didn't do anything for me at all. I got no contact from him, couldn't, he didn't arrange anything for me while I, I've been released. All my mates who've been released in football, getting trials here, there, and everywhere, and 
I suppose some of that was on me. I should have gone out and got it myself. I, I shouldn't have been so expect, expecting for him to do something. Um, so I ended up going to a non-league. Um, I went to Buxton, Matlock. Um, that didn't work out there. And then um, I ended up at Scarborough because I'd had a good, had a good, I had a good see, uh, month or two with them. Um, and the managers were still the same, Brian Hughes. Um, he said, come back and, and we'll have you back. But then obviously, because I'd been out so long with injury and I'd been released, I'd gone about nearly a year without playing football. And um, when I came back, I worked myself. I worked the player I was a year earlier when I was there. And I weren't getting played at Scarborough. Um, I went to Matlock. I weren't getting played there. So I just quit. I stopped playing. I, I jacked it in. I had about six months. No, maybe five months out, just not playing. Um, I thought, why am I doing this? I'm not, I can't sit on a bench. I'm not saying I deserve to play, but I struggle to sit on a bench and watch, watch football. I can't sit in the sands and watch football. Um, so I thought, I'm not travelling all over all over the leagues to, to sit on a bench and not play. Um, so I stopped playing. <clears throat> and to be fair, for those four or five months I weren't playing, I had time, because I was doing part-time coaching, I had time to keep fit as well and I was ticking over. And I was the best I, I, I'd ever been. I got my, my head in a good way. I was feeling good about myself. And then my manager at work got the um, the Osset job in non-league. And I've followed him ever since. Um, and he's just a manager that's kind of put faith in me and said, look, I'm, you're going to play. I'm, I'm, I, I want you up there. Um, he named me captain wherever he's been. <clears throat> you know, he just showed faith in me. And from that point, I just fell in love with football again. And I want to play again. And I got that burning desire to play football again and it's not gone away since luckily enough I think that leads into your question how's it uh, having experience in both in and out of football how how has it shaped your view on mental health and how is it, how important is uh, support and really important uh, like I say I, if it had not been for that experience in my, when I got released and when I got injured, I, I'd have probably had a different view on it, but I think mental health is massively important, uh, it, it's, especially in football, because at the end of the day, it's ruthless. It's a business. Um, and you can get a ship decided as quick as you can get brought in. And I think it's important to support those people that aren't going to make it, they're not going to, that haven't made it, or there's an injury, or there's something that stopped them. Um, but I don't think... I don't think people are willing, open enough to talk about it in order to gain that support. Because I'm sure if I would have mentioned it to somebody at the FA or the PFA that I was struggling, I would have got the support that I possibly needed. Um, however, it's just people being open enough, open enough to, to talk about it. But then, of course, once you're out of football, there's that, there's that mental side to it. But then in everyday life, like you say, then you've got to start go, go, going into job interviews. You've got to start talking to people you don't know. <clears throat> And doing all these different things that are new to you because you've lived in a bubble, a football bubble, for the last four years. And that's when I think that mental side, that mental health side really, really comes into play. Um, and I think it's massive. I really do. I don't... I, I, I think without that, without that experience in football, I would have a different view. But now, I think the mental health side, in both in football and out of it, is, is big. I appreciate that. I appreciate the the honesty and openness about it. Um, just a couple of questions to finish off then. You alluded, you got into uh, into primary school coaching and, and primary school PE. Um, quite a few of our students look down, look to go down similar pathways and stuff like that. Like, What would you say are the key skills and attributes and what to look out for if you're going down going down that pathway? Um, I'd certainly advise it because it's the most rewarding thing I've done um, to, to help children. Um to, to support people that, are, that need developing to do these different things in school. It's so rewarding. And I, 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 for the four or five years I was doing it, I never woke up and thought, I don't want to go to work today. I don't want to do this. So the first thing I'd say is definitely you, you need to try and do everything you can to succeed in that area. So in regards to what you've got to be to do that is you've got to be open-minded because you're – as a coach in school or as a, a member of school, you get approach of all different kind of um, situations um, and different obstacles. 
Um, you've got to be adaptable, like I say, because at the end of the day, you don't know what you're going to be dealt with. If you're coaching the school, again, different situations arise constantly. Um, but I'd say, if you're, going to, if you're going to do that in school, you just need to be happy and enjoy being there. Because if you can enjoy being around those children and, and, and helping support them, and they're, they're going to enjoy it as well, and they're going to want to progress, and that only makes you a better coach, it makes you enjoy your job more. And, it, and when you're enjoying your job, you want to progress yourself further as well. Um, so I would say, make sure you're doing, you enjoy what you're doing. And you're going to do that. If you, if you are doing your role properly and you're trying to develop yourself and you're engaging properly with the children and you're doing all these different things that's being asked of you, you will enjoy your job. Real. Aaron, do you want to just round off with, with your final question? Yeah. Uh, last one before I close it out. Uh, if you could give one piece of advice to your younger self, what would it be? Um, I would have to say, I mean, I've just alluded to it, is enjoy, enjoy what you're doing. Find something you enjoy and make it a success. Because if you wake up every morning enjoying your job and wanting to go to work, it's not, it's not a job. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I loved the football experience and what it was, what it is. Um, but I think I might have done a few things a little bit different when I was younger if I didn't know what the outcome was going to be after two years of playing professional. Um, but yeah, it would just to be enjoy what you're doing. Don't matter about money. If you like, you don't have to be money orientated. Just make sure whatever you're doing, you enjoy it and you do it to your, to your best of your ability. <coughs> Appreciate that. Um, to be fair, that rounds off nicely. And I think the stuff you've touched upon there is going to be massively applicable to, to our students as their heads start to turn towards their futures and knowing sort of the attitude to take and, and the importance of mental health and, and, to, and to really access that support at point. Um, so all that's left for us to say, Alex, is best of luck with your future endeavours, both in football and out of football. Um, hopefully the season gets back up and running for you soon. Um, and thank you very much for, for being a part of the Beyond Sport podcast. No problem. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank Good you, Alex. Thank you, Max.